something? Huh? Can you say something about Parikrama? Something about Parikrama? Yeah. 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 <coughs> Hare Krishna. So I'm out here on Parikrama. I usually come out here this time of the year on Parikrama. It's really ecstatic. It's very joyful to be out here in the association of so many devotees. We're having a wonderful time. We are visiting all the holy places, seeing seeing the temples and the deities and hearing the glories of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It's very unforgettable experience. If you have not been on Parikrama, then you don't know what you're missing. It's really very wonderful to be out here on Parikrama. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yeah, if you have spiritual vision, <laughs> then you'll know the place. Right. Anyway, uh, Mahatpur, we should hear the pastime how the Pandavas came here to Mahatpur in this region, somewhere around these forests. Pandavas were living in exile. They had to go incognito, they had to be in exile for 12 years and one year incognito. So they were living in the forest, moving around. At one point they came to Eka Chakra. Eka Chakra is in Radha Desh. How many of you have been to Eka Chakra? Yeah, if you haven't been to Eka Chakra, you need to go to Eka Chakra. You should go. It's, it's a, one of the important holy places. You know, we do try to visit all the places, like after this parikram is over, then there's the Ikarasi, and then the day after Ikarasi, the Dwarasi, we celebrate the appearance day of Madhavendra Puri. And there's a big festival at Shantipur. So Shantipur festival, we arrange buses, free. <laughs> You don't get much free in Mayapur these days, but <laughs> there's a free bus 
to take everyone to Shantipur on the Dwadasi. And there's a big festival there. And it says, anyone who takes prasadam or who cooks prasadam or distributes prasadam in Shantipur, on that day, they will get Krishna Prem. And so if you want Krishna Prem, you have to go to Shantipur on that day. Very big festival. Thousands of people come and we distribute prasadam kitchenry to everyone. So Shantipur is one of the important places in the out. It's an hour, over an hour from Mayapur by bus. Aika Chakra is a bit further away than Shantipur in another direction. Aika Chakra is in a place called Radha Desh. Radha Desh means a place where the Ganga does not flow. But it's a holy place. Lord Nityananda appeared there in Eka Chakra Dham. It's also a Dham. Lord Nityananda resides there. So in Eka Chakra, there's no Ganga. So how could it be a Dham? Usually the Dham, the holy places, are all beside the Ganga. Should be the Ganga, being beside the side of the Ganga. But Eka Chakra is not near the Ganga. How is it a holy place? So the answer is given, it's a holy place because the Pandavas came there. And wherever the Pandavas stay becomes a holy place. Right? I told you yesterday, Tirti Kurvanti Tirtani. It's the devotees, it's the saintly persons. When they come to a place, they make the, the place a holy place. So the Pandavas, they came to Eka Chakra and they resided there for some time. But they were given shelter in the home of one poor Brahmana and his wife. And they invited the Pandavas along with Draupadi that they could come and stay in their home. And the Brahmana, he lived by begging. And they would, when the Pandavas came to live in their her home, the Pandavas would also go out for begging, but they would take turn. One person every day would stay back to be with Mother Kunt, uh, to be with Draupadi and the Brahmana's wife, just to take care. They thought, we won't send everyone out for begging. One person should stay back. So they took turns to stay back. So it happened that one day when they were all begging and Bhima was left at home, at that time, they heard the Brahmana talking with his wife. And the Brahmana's wife was crying because it, there was a demon who was terrorizing that place, Eka Chakra. And all the people were so afraid because this big demon was a Rakshasa and he was eating humans. So they made an agreement with the demon that, look, you don't have to come and, and terrorize all of us. We will send to you food and we, we will send also one person and one cow and a, a big cart of food for you. We will send to you every day. So then the demon thought, oh, very good. I won't have to come and myself work to get my food. You can send it to me. All right, that's very good. So it turned out that when the Pandavas came to stay in the house of that Brahmana, it came to that Brahmana, it was that Brahmana's turn that he had to provide for the demon. He had to provide food. He had to send a cartload of food along with a cow and one of the family also had to go to be eaten by the Rakshasa. So the Brahmana was saying, I will go. But the Brahmana had a son and the son would say, no father, I will go, let me go. I'm your son, it's your duty, it's my duty, I should serve you. I will go. 
And so like this, they were talking and the mother was crying. Naturally, she didn't want either of them to go and be eaten by the Rakshasa. So, Bhima overheard all of this and he said, to him, well, look, you know, it's not a problem. I can go. Let me go. I will take your place. Let me go. I'm, you know, I can go there and meet this Rakshasa. I will deal with him. And so they were reluctant, but Bhima said, no, no, it's not a problem. I'm happy to go. Give me the cartload of food. <laughs> And so they, were, they prepared a big cartload of food and Bhima took, went off with a cartload of food and naturally he began to eat the food. <laughs> and he was enjoying it, he's thinking, it's very nice, this is very good. And so they got to the place where the Rakshasa was and the Rakshasa came out and he saw, there's no food, who's eating all the food? And then Bhima confronted him. And so Bhima said, yes, I've taken the food. Who are you? And, and like this, there was, and then came the inevitable battle. And Bhima ripped into that Rakshasa and tore that Rakshasa to pieces and killed him and defeated him. So what happened was while Bhima was away doing that, dealing with the Rakshasa, at that time, Arjuna came home. And Arjuna came home and he asked, well, where's Bhima? I thought Bhima was staying here to take care of you. And they said, no, no, he went to deal with one Rakshasa. There's a big Rakshasa and Bhima went there to take food to him and deal with him. So Arjuna became a little worried. He thought, really? A big Rakshasa? Oh, maybe, maybe Bhima's in trouble. I should go there and find out what's happening. So Arjuna then left. He went to find out what had happened to Bhima. And when Arjuna was going, he became so worried, he thought, let me fire a Nagapashu, and that will protect Bhima in case there's any danger. So he, re he released one Nagapashu, the snake arrow, he fired the snake arrow, and he released it. But after he fired it, then, after a short time, then he met up with Bhima. And Bhima was coming back after defeating the Rakshasa. And Arjuna said, oh, I was so worried about you. I fired the Nagapashu, I've released the Nagapashu, what should we do? So Arjuna said, it, it was decided, we will have that Nagapashu just simply remain in the forest, that he has to stay in this one place. Anybody who comes near it, then the Nagapashu can devour it, can devour them. So in this way that Naga Pashu was remaining there in the forest in one place and he stayed there for a long time. So that was in the time of the Pandavas. After that, then 500 years ago, Lord Nityananda appeared there in Ekta Chakra. And Lord Nityananda was one day playing with all of his friends and they came to that forest and he heard how there's this big snake there. And Lord Nityananda, being the omniscient personality of Godhead, he could understand this Nagapashu, that was what was released by Arjuna in the previous Yuga, when he was there in exile, when, he, when the Pandavas were all staying there in Ekachakra, he had released that Nagapashu. So Lord Nityananda went there to that place where the snake was. The Lord Nityananda, who is Lord Nityananda? He, Anantashesh, yeah, Anantashesh, Sankarshan, is none different from Lord Nityananda. He's the king of all snakes. So he went there and he spoke to that Nagapashu. He said, you have to stop devouring all the people. They will make a hole for you, you stay in that hole, you stay there. But the snake said, well, if I stay there, how will I get food? How will I eat? But Lord Nityananda said, no, I will arrange, we will, people will come and worship you, and they will offer milk to you, As if, because you will be the snake. When they come, they will come here, and they will offer you worship. You don't have to devour them. 
with their worship, they will offer you milk. And Lord Nityananda then took a ring and he put it as a cover over the hole where the snake was. And this way Lord Nityananda, oh, with an earring, not a, a ring, an earring. That's why Lord Nityananda has one earring. He doesn't have to, he took one earring off and used it to cover the hole where that Nagapashu snake was residing. So the Pandavas were there in Eka Chakra, but when they were there in Eka Chakra, at that time, Maharaj Yudhisthira, he got a dream. And in his dream, Lord Balaram appeared to him. Rajendra Nandana say, Balaram hoi lo? So Lord Balaram came as Nitai, and Lord Balaram, he spoke to Maharaj Yudhisthira, and he told him, he said, you have come to Eka Chakra. You must go on now and see Navadweep. You must go and see the beauty of this place, Navadweep. And so the, the Pandavas, the five Pandavas, they heard about Maharaj Yudhisthira's dream and they all decided, yeah, we better go. They took the dream as being divine instruction. When you dream about Lord Krishna, or you dream of instruction from your spiritual master, you should take it very seriously. Just like Srila Prabhupada dreamed about his spiritual teacher telling him, you have to take sannyas, you have to write books, you have to go to the West. The different instructions were coming. And Prabhupada was thinking, Oh, it's very difficult. Oh, no, I don't think. Oh, he was reluctant. With great reluctancy, Prabhupada changed his position. He changed from Grihastha into Vanaprastha and then into Sanyas, only with great reluctance. But because the instruction was coming from superior authority, he took it very seriously. And so he did what he had been ordered and it came out successful. So similarly the Pandavas through Maharaj Yudhisthira, they were ordered, don't just stay in Eka Chakra, go to Navadvi and see the beauty of that holy place, Navadvi. Visit the different places in Navadvi. So they came here to this mode of Drumadvi and they became Happy, right? Maybe they found the banyan tree. We're looking for it. <laughs> We're still looking for it. So in this way, they enjoyed the beauty of Moda Drumadweep. And what's the process here in Moda Drumadweep? Servant. Be the servant, right? So we began our parikrama, we were in Godrum Dweep. In Godrum Dweep, what was the process? Kirtan. Kirtan, right. What happened? You didn't do any hearing, you just went to Kirtan? What about the hearing? How can you do Kirtan without hearing? So our parikram is a little irregular. We should have begun in Simansapur, but because there's so many parties, it wasn't possible to follow the usual procedure. We had to begin in Godrum Tweet. We began with Kirtan. So we missed out the hearing. But we'll do it before we go back to Mayapur. From Godrum Tweet, then we went to Madhya Madhvit. Madhya Madhvit process was Maranam, remembering. Right? Remembering. Always remember Krishna. So that, that was uh, when we were in Madhya Madhvip. Who were we hearing? Whose pastimes were we hearing in Madhya Madhvip? Madhya Madhvip? <laughs> I hope so. I hope we heard about Goranga. Yeah. Hamsa Bahan. Nanmisharanya. Pushka. Hari Harshit. Hari Harshit. Gudrum. Gudrum. Okay, so then Madhya Madhvi, we were remembering. 
when after much a much week, then Kola Dweep, we crossed over the Ganga into Kola Dweep, which was present-day Nava Dweep. And in Kola Dweep, process was Padasevanam. Actually, the whole Parikrama is Padasevanam, serving the Holy Dham, doing Parikrama. So we were in Kola Dweep, and we heard about Lord Varaha, we heard about Devananda. Jagannath Das Babaji Maharaj Samadhi was there, but in Kutiya. Jamishul Mahaprabhu. And Maya is there as? Proda Maya. Right, Proda Maya. In Navajit, Proda Maya. In Vrindavan, Proda Maya is? Purnamasi. <laughs> I, I, I have to be careful who I listen to. <laughs> Sometimes they're wrong. <laughs> so Purnamasi is in Vrindavan. She's arranging all the pastimes of Radha and Krishna. But in Navadvip, Prodamaya. And Prodamaya arranges to cover up the holy dham from the non-devotees. The non-devotees, she doesn't want them to see the glory of the holy dham. So she covers up the holy dawn. That's why the Maya poor, the place of Maya. Maya is covered, the whole dawn is covered by Maya for the materialistic people, for the non devotees. They come and they buy ice cream and they drink Coca Cola and it makes real happiness. So that's a, for them, that's a visit to Maya poor. You know, they have their own experience of Maya in Mayapur. <laughs> so Proda Maya was there in the in that marketplace right there in Navadvip, Padasevanam. And then after Pad after after coming to uh Kola Dweep, then we went to Dweep, where all the seasons are present. All the beautiful seasons, six seasons. So, uh, we in Ritu Dweep, remember all the wonderful people, how the whole village would come out, so many people. Usually, sometimes in the beginning, you see little children come out. Then later on, after some time, then the ladies start to come out. And now even the men are coming out. You know, I was amazed to see when we were coming through. You, you know, in the beginning, when we first did Parikram, in the beginning, all the little children would come and look at us. After some time, then the ladies would come. Now the men are even there looking at us. It's amazing, you know, everyone coming out to see us. The whole, the whole place, I think. So, uh, Ritu Dweep, we heard about in Ritu Dweep. Samudra Gar. Right? Samudra Gar. Samudra Sain. Remember, we had the great battle, Bhima fighting Samudra Sain, and Lord Krishna having to come to convince Samudra Sain. In every age, the Lord comes in this town. In the Satya Yuga, how does the Lord come in Navadvip Dham? As who? Huh? Yes. Nishingadev, that's one for also as Varaha. Lord Varaha he appeared. Remember the temple was there called the Dweep? So yeah. And then in Treta Yuga the Lord comes. Lord Ramachandra and Dwapara Yuga. Lord Krishna. Right, he came to to for Samudra saying. And in Kali Yuga does he come? I hope he comes, yeah. <laughs> yeah comes. So, the, in, the, the, in every age, the Lord comes. And the Acharyas of the four Sampradayas, they also come here. We have Ramanujacharya also coming. He was told. Who told him? Jagannath. Lord Jagannath personally told Ramanuja, you go to Navadweep. Go and see Navadweep. Go and see this place. Ramanuja, you know, tried to interfere with the worship of Lord Jagannath. Lord Jagannath didn't like it. He threw him out <laughs> of Jagannath Puri. 
He woke up the next morning in Kurmachit. <laughs> Not Kurukshit, but Kurmachit. <laughs> so, uh, Lord Jagannath told Ramanuja, go and see the beauty of Navadvip. And but, but he said, you don't have to preach your Dashya Bhakti there. The devotees there in Navadri, they're doing Gora Bhakti, not just simply Dashya Bhakti, which is the, you know, the mode of Aishwarya, which is practiced in the Sri Sampradaya. They worship the Lord with great awe and reverence. You go there, if you go there at the time of the uh, the Rud Mahotra, yeah, there's a big procession, and you'll see all the Brahmins, they chant all the Vedic mantras, all the prayers. You know, it's quite different from our Rathiatra, you know. Rathiatra is you know, all jumping and dancing, and you go there to their program, and they have a chariot festival. <laughs> Very sober. Om Sahasrata, like that, they're chanting the prayers. So they have Dashara. Aishwarya, they worship the Lord in Aishwarya. Our, our we're practicing Gora Bhakti. The Gora Bhakti is a very whole different mood, right? The teaching of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, worshiping the Lord in to get his mercy. Odarya Lila, right? Odarya, the mercy of the Lord. And similarly, Madhvacharya also, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he went to Udupi, he met with Madhvacharya. Madhvacharya also came to Navadvip. But you know his what the, what the Madhvas, what do they do? Mainly Karmakandi rituals. They're pregnant. But one good thing which the Lord encouraged Madhvacharya, you go everywhere, travel and preach and defeat the Mayavada. And that was why Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, one of the reasons why Mahaprabhu took initiation in the line of Madhvacharya, that he wanted, he liked that complete refutal of the Mayavadi philosophy. If you go to the Madhvas, I was down in Bangalore and they have a Sanskrit college there. They take in young men from the age of about uh, like five or six years old up until about 21, they take the young men in and they will train them in the philosophy as taught by Madhvacharya. And they're trained very thoroughly how to defeat Mayavada philosophy. That's the essence of the, and that's what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu liked. Remember, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took two elements from each of the four sampradayas. From the Ramanuja Sampradaya, he took the element of serving the devotee, Vaishnava Seva, and also establishing devotional service without desire for furtive activity or impersonal speculation. In other words, no desire for karma or dhyana, pure bhakti. Those were the two elements from the Sri Sampradaya. From Madhvacharya, he took the element, the complete defeat of Mayavada philosophy and the worship of the Sri, of the deity. Worshipping the deity as a person. We don't do Murti Puja. We worship the Lord as a deity, Sri Vigraha. Vigraha. It's, it's an avatar. The Lord appears in the deity form. It's not just simply a statue which we're worshipping and we think, oh, he, he symbolizes the Lord. Like you go to a Hindu temple, you know, general Hindu temple, and they have a deity there. They're worshipping the deity, but it, they're actually not deity. They're worshipping, they do murti puja. They just simply think of it as a statue. They don't change the dreads, they don't make regular offerings, hardly, very rare they will ever cook, but they'll do RT and puja and like that. They'll do some RT. So that they don't see the Lord in the deity. They, they simply think it's a statue and it's a means to their liberation because for them, their goal, generally they're all Impersonal, their goal is Sayuja Mukti, to become one 
to enter into the oneness. And they think, by worshipping the statue, one day I will also become the statue. I'll become like this. <laughs> so that's kind of their thinking. But we worship the deity as God himself, that the Lord appears in the elements. And the Lord can speak to the devotee, just like Shakshi Gopal, the deity was speaking to the devotee. And the deity can eat, and the deity can, he can steal, steal the Mahaprasadam to give to his devotees, like Shira Koragopina. So we understand the deity as a very living personality, it's avatar, the Lord comes from the spiritual world and he descends into the deity form in order to accept our worship. So Madhvacharyas, they had that principle, they, uh, Madhvacharya established the worship of Udupi Krishna and their worship, it happened one day because they had a rule about who could get into the temple and who couldn't. And so one man who was actually a great devotee, he wasn't able to get into the temple and he was looking at the deity from the back through a hole in the wall and he could see the back of the deity and he was thinking how wonderful it would be to see the front of the deity. So at that time, the deity turned around. And when the deity turned around, so that he could reveal his form to that man. So after that, the priest said, well, we cannot turn him back. So they continue the worship of the deity in that way, standing in that position. And they had to redesign the temple, of course, and everything. <laughs> but, but they accepted that this was the deity's desire, that he wanted to re reveal his form to this devotee. So these things happen when the deity is properly worshipped. That you'll see life in the deity. How the deity reciprocates with the love of his devotee. It, it's not impersonal. It, we're not just worshipping some statue. So Madhvacharya, he was told, you don't need to come to Navadrikdan, but you go everywhere and defeat the Maya bodies defeat their philosophy. And of course, Srila Prabhupada also has that in his own pranam mantra. Nirvishesha Shunyavadi. Srila Prabhupada offers his respects to his spiritual master, it's serving my spiritual master, Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati. Gauravani, preaching the message of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the Western world which is full of impersonalism and voidism, or to save the Western world from impersonalism and voidism. How can we ever save India from impersonalism and voidism? That's the bigger challenge. Bhagavad Gita. Huh? Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, distribute more. But they also have Bhagavad Gita. Shankaracharya also has commentary on Bhagavad Gita. It's not just dis distribute Bhagavad Gita, but preach the Bhagavad Gita. Teach. Just Don't just only distribute the books, but we have to teach. And now we're seeing so many wonderful programs going on everywhere. I met some devotee from Mangalore, and he was telling me how in Mangalore, they have 150 teachers and they have classes, they have courses going on in 12 languages and they're teaching the Bhagavad Gita in five different levels, very structured program. And so they have like thousands, you know, the congregation just expanded unlimitedly by preaching, by having these courses by offering these kind of courses to people, letting them, let, letting them come and enroll online, they can study the Bhagavad Gita. And they have these courses going on all over. And it's all based in Mangalore. I told Krishna Prabhu, the uh, director of education there in Mayapur, he goes there regularly to Mayapur, uh, to Mangalore, and he trained all the devotees there, he trained the devotees how to teach, how to do the teaching work, and they've had huge success. The devotee told me they had no money initially. He said, but after they started doing all these courses, 
They got so many people, so many students, and they got, when they wanted donations, they got so much money, all the money they needed. They could purchase land, and then now they're building a big temple. So preaching, teaching, very, very important. Not just only distribute the books, but teach, have classes, somehow reach out to people. So the Acharyas, they all came here. I think tomorrow or the next day we'll be seeing Shankapur, Shankatapur, place where Shankaracharya came. And of course they told Shankaracharya, you go out from here. We don't want you here. He was told to go. Now Shankaracharya, of course, is the Lord Shiva, and he has a mission. Mayavada asa chastram prachanam bodha mochate. Prachanam bodha. It means covered Buddhism. My, the Shankaracharya did a great service for the world. He brought back the Vedic culture by defeating Buddhism. Buddhism is Gnostic, atheistic philosophy. But it was Shankaracharya who defeated it by presenting Mayavada Asa Chastra, the Maya, by presenting the Mayavadi philosophy. The Buddhists would say the absolute truth is zero, nothing, zero, dunyavada, void, nothing. They say nothing is real. You are not real, I'm not real. So take a break and beat them on the head and say it's, it's not real. <laughs> so the Buddhist philosophy is Gnostic philosophy and Shankaracharya, he just changed a little bit. The absolute truth is not zero, it is one. One. Advaita, Monist, Monist philosophy. So Shankaracharya brought back the Vedas by that way. And he established also strict Brahmanas. Why did, why did the Buddhist, Buddhist philosophy come up in India? Because of the degradation and corruption among the Brahminical castes. Because they had become so degraded, they had encouraged the people in killing the animals and performing sacrifice, doing all this nonsense. So. Lord Buddha came and he led the people away from the Vedas and he taught them, no, it's all, you know, we're all the same, everybody, you don't need any Brahmins, you don't need the Vedas, just follow me. So Lord Buddha came to trick the atheists that they will follow him. Then later on Shankaracharya came and his service was to bring back the Vedas and establish proper Brahminical culture. And then later on the Vaishnava Acharyas came and they taught the real purport behind the Vedas with the Vaishnava philosophy. So after the Vaishnava, after Ramanuja Acharya, Madhvacharya, like that, then Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came and he gave the synthesis of the four sampradayas. He took the main elements from each of the four sampradayas, brought them into the Gaudiya Vaishnava sampradaya. And he himself took initiation in the line from Madhva. And he took the initiation in the line from Madhva because of Madhavendra Puri. And it was Madhavendra Puri who actually brought the seed of love of God into the line of disciplic succession. He taught the, the, um, the mood of Raga Bhakti, worshipping the Lord and with transcendental feelings, transcendental emotions. So that's what Madhavendra Puri's great contribution. And Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wanted to be connected to Madhavendra Puri. And that's why he took the initiation in that line, coming from Madhva. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu established the Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya. Gaudiya Vaishnavism, not just simply preaching Dashara. And we're not worshipping Krishna like the Pushtimar people. <laughs> they worship Krishna in the Bala form as a child. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught that the supreme form of the Lord is Nava Yogana, eternally youthful. As a youth, as in its eternal youthful form, the Lord performs his pastimes. That is 
the, how we worship Radha and Krishna. Pushtimar people, they are worshipping Krishna as a child. They simply see Krishna as a child. They'll offer the milk sweets. They'll do different things which you would do for a child. But we worship Krishna as the eternal youthful person. And in this way we celebrate Krishna's pastimes. So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did this wonderful service for all of us. We're trying to appreciate the Holy Dham by going around these islands. Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Parma Vakya, 
Okay, thank you very much, Bhakti Prachar, Bari Prajak, Swami Maharaj. And now we're going to hear from Prabodhananda Swami Maharaj. Oh, Prabodhananda Saraswati Swami Maharaj. Maharaj is going to tell us about. <laughs> anyway, he's blessed by Saraswati, so he will come. <laughs> Thank you very much, Vaishnava Maharaj. We're going to have a quick drama. Huh? Can the money pass? What about the drama? Huh? 
Nitai and Gaur Gunamani are dancing and dancing with beloved Gadarhar on their left and Srivas and Advaita on the right, while their associates defeat the stars that surround the Gora moon. The Mridanga and Kartals are played and sweet songs are sung. The sky is filled with the chanting of Harinam. His body is anointed with sandalwood paste and drops of holy juice and a forest flower garland dangles nicely across his chest. A white Brahmin thread hangs across his neck. His form defeats millions of cupids and ankle bells jingle on his feet. The two brothers are dancing and their associates sing while Gadarha's body is pelted with powder. Now the Lord re-manifests his previous joyful Vrindavan pastimes in this Nadia. Now he enjoys on the bank of the Ganga just like in Vrindavan's Dira Samira Kunj, Vrindavan Das tells you, for he knows it. Vrindavan Das Thakur Ki. So this is the, the birthplace of Srila Vrindavan Das Thakur. But where is the Bhakti Vivek? Anyway, every year we've been coming here to, to this uh, temple. This is Gaudiya temple. And, you know, it's not easy to maintain the temple in this place. There's not a lot of people. And sometimes they get robbed. I remember a couple of years back we came here and they, they, they were in just very great difficulties. People, thieves have come in the night and they stole all their cooking utensils, whatever they could, with whatever they could get, which was of any value, they took it. So it's difficult to maintain temples here in the Holy Dham. So in that, those times, a few years ago, there were just some older men staying here, re retired men. In recent times, the Gaudiya Mat have sent uh, a sannyasi here, I don't know where he is anyway. Bhakti Vivek Sagar Maharaj, a younger sannyasi, has come here, he's taken over the responsibility. And actually you can see you're sitting now on concrete. Last year there was no concrete, it was only air. So they've laid some concrete there. <laughs> So, uh, he, the, the sannyasi now, Vivek Sagar Maharaj was saying that he wants to put in toilets here to have uh, latrines available for both men and ladies. So he's asking if we can also contribute towards that. So if some of those of you who are able, if you're able to contribute some contributions, it will be much appreciated. Okay, thank you. Now we're going to have some speakers. Uh, we were going to speak yesterday. Yes, yesterday we were in Janamuni's ashram. In Janamuni's ashram, the process is dasya, right? Vandanam, Vandanam. Sorry, Vandanam. So in Janamuni's ashram, the process is Vandanam. So we, we didn't speak really about Vandanam process, so this morning we're going to invite His Holiness Bhakti Ratnakar Ambarish Maharaj to tell us about Vandanam. <laughs> The 
There was one American gospel singer named the Reverend Gary Davis. And he came and met Prabhupada in New York in the 1960s. He was quite a famous man, Reverend Gary Davis. He had a lot of recordings of his gospel songs. So he came to Prabhupada and he was asking Prabhupada, Swamiji, what to pray for? He could understand that it's not good to just pray to get money or to get fame or any kind of material thing, but he didn't know what to pray for. Of course, to Srila Prabhupada it was very clear what to pray for. And of course that's our chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra. Our prayer is, please engage us in your service. Please engage me in your service. So, it, chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra is both a prayer and it's the answer to the prayers also. It's the answer to all of our prayers when we're chanting. So today is also a auspicious day. Today is the Vyasa Puja day of His Holiness Bhakti Tirtha Swami Maharaj. <laughs> so devotees in Mayapur will be celebrating that event and Kavi Chandra Swami is going to go there to Mayapur in a little while to take part in the festival there. So Bhakti Tirtha Swami did a lot of wonderful preaching on behalf of Srila Prabhupada. He was a black-bodied American. He joined the New York Temple in Brooklyn, the old Brooklyn Temple, Henry Street, in the 1970s. He was a graduate from Princeton University. He was not some illiterate hippie. He was from, you know, very well educated, Ivy League education, and he had a very good job. And he started coming to the temple. He met devotees, started coming to the temple in Brooklyn. And at one point, uh, Satsvarupa Maharaj had written to the temple asking, is there anybody there who could take up the service of being secretary? He said, I need a secretary. At that time, Satsvarupa Maharaj was based in Texas and he was doing a lot of writing and preaching and he wanted a secretary. So Bhakti Tirtha at that time, he was coming to the temple. He hadn't moved into the temple, but he was coming and we all knew him. So we told him, you know, why don't you take up this job? Go and serve Satsvarupa Maharaj. And he did it. He gave up his job and he moved to Texas. And he became secretary there for Satsvarupa Das Goswami. And he was serving him and traveling with him. And he was doing a lot of nice service. Then at one point Prabhupada began, or he, Prabhupada wanted the books the, the uh, Bhaktivedanta book trust sets like Bhagavatam and Chaitanya Charitamrita, he wanted they should be introduced into the university. And so they formed the library party. And they were, he was, he was put on that. Satsvarupa Maharaj was also heading it up. And they would go and meet professors and they would introduce the Bhaktivedanta trust books to them. So Bhakti Tirtha Swami, having a very good education from Princeton, he was very good at that and he would go into the universities, he would meet the professors, make nice relationships with them and arrange programs and get them to take books. And then he went to Eastern Europe. At the time when Eastern Europe was still closed, it was still closed. Germany was divided, East and West Germany, and there was like a, a brick wall down the middle of the country. But Bhakti Tirtha, uh, he was engaged in that service, the, going into the Eastern Europe and introducing the books of Bhaktivedanta Book Trust there. 
And he did very, very wonderful service. He sold many, many books. He cultivated many people. And Prabhupada was very pleased with him. Prabhupada appreciated very much his service. At that time, he was still a brahmachari. Later on, after Prabhupada's departure, then he took sannyas. Actually, Prabhupada had also indicated that he should, he should go to Africa and develop the preaching in Africa. At that time, we didn't have anything really going on in Nigeria or Ghana or anywhere. There was only one center in Nairobi, the, in Mombasa. That was about all, all was going on in Africa. Maybe oh, South Africa, there was a temple in Durban. Anyway, Bhakti Tirtha was then sent, to, he went over to Africa and he did pioneering preaching there in Africa. And he became like a, like a king there. He was worshipped like a king. The, the people, the local African people, they made him like one of the rulers there in Africa. But still, he would sometimes come back to the West. I remember uh, Srila Rameshwara Prabhu was describing, he said at one point, they were in, devotees had been invited on a television program there in America, and they wanted somebody to go on this show. But the program was really, it was one of these programs where the person who hosts the show is super nasty. And they can, they, you know, they, whatever you say, they'll just cut you to pieces and they'll make you feel really low. Yeah, you know, they, they, you know, you get these kind of programs where people are really good at insulting other people. So they, they wanted the devotees to go on to the short program. They wanted someone to do it. So they, they called Bhakti Tirtha Swami to come. Rameshwara said, you're the only one who can do it. And he went on the show and, and the, well, the, the interview was so sweet, this became very nice and appreciated Bhakti Tirtha so much. So he had that kind of expertise. He was very, very wonderful, very powerful preacher. And he loved to dance in the kirtan. He was very energetic and lively. Uh, with Lokanath Swami dance, doing kirtan, Bhakti Tirtha would become electrified, <laughs> chanting and dancing in great ecstasy. So today we're remembering him as his Vyasa Puja. There's two things that are proud of. Sagar Maharaj, he's the resident Swami here, and he wants to build some nice touch toilets here to make it easier for devotees when the pilgrims come, because often they get several thousands of devotees. So he'll come round, if you can all give some kind of contribution, it will be helpful for him. All right, so we still have a few people to speak about in this place here. We heard about Krishna uh, Vrindavan Das Thakur. The first temple we went to was Saranga Marari. Saranga Thakur. So Saranga Thakur, he was living here, he was, this place is jungle. There was nothing here. They're just tigers, wild animals. So Saranga was in his old age. He didn't have any disciples. So one day Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told him, you know Saranga, you're old man. You have to take a disciple. So Saranga said, well, you know, uh, t disciples, they're a headache, you know, isn't it? You have disciples, oh, it's such a headache to take care of disciples. I didn't take any disciples. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, no, you should take a disciple. At least you take one disciple. So he said, okay, tomorrow, the first person I meet, I will take him as a disciple. So early the next morning, Saranga Thakur was going into Ganga to take his bath and it happened when he put his foot in the water, he touched a body. There was a body floating in the Ganga. So it was a young boy, teenage, quite young boy, like maybe 10, 12 years old. And he touched the body and when he touched the body, somehow the body came back to life. What had happened was, young boy had been bitten by a snake. 
and he'd fallen unconscious. So the parents, they thought he was dead. Everybody thought he's dead. But they didn't know. So they put him on a banana boat. And the system, they put the body, they don't burn the bodies of young children. So what they did, they put the body on a banana boat, banana tree or something. And they had it floating down the Ganga. So it happened that next, that morning, Saranga took his bath, touched that body, and the boy came in consciousness. And, and so that boy came to live with Saranga Thakur. He became known as Saranga's Morari. Morari was the name of the boy. So when the parents found out, they came and they came to see the young boy and they said, you should come home. We are your parents. The, but the boy said, no, 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 no. I already died. You put me on the Ganga. I'm no more, you're not my mother and father anymore. This is my second life. So he wouldn't go home. He stayed with Saranga. And he also became very great, very powerful devotee. So Saranga Morali said, they, they would play with the tigers and slap the tigers. They were so fearless. So the two of them lived here. Their deities were there. And the other personality, we saw there are three sets of deities here. One set was Saranga Thakur's deity, and then uh, Vrindavan Das Thakur. We have to speak of oh, Vrindavan Das Thakur's here, but. Uh, Vasudev Datta. Vasudev Datta, very important personality in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastime. Vasudev Datta came to see Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and he prayed to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, let me take the sins of all the people and I will stay here. Let them all be liberated. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu heard this, Tears came in his eyes and, and he, he was so happy. It thought, oh, so wonderful. You know, sometimes we ask people, you know, they bring somebody for initiation. They say, Maharaj, initiate this person, they're good. And you say, okay, are you willing to take their karma? And they no, no, I'm only introducing them. But you're introducing them to me to take their karma. Are you going to take their karma? No, 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 I'm not going to take the karma. Why should I take the karma? So sometimes that happens. So Vasudev Datta had a different mood. He said, let me take the karma and I will stay here and let all the sinful people all be liberated. Mahaprabhu said, oh, this is wonderful. This is the mood of Prahlad. You must be the incarnation of Prahlad Maharaj. And by the arrangement of Mahaprabhu, they were all delivered. The examples were given. Different examples were given. Just like if you have a bag of mustard seeds. So you have a bag of mustard seeds, right? We grow mustard in Mayapur. You know, around Navadweep, mustard is easy to grow. We tried. I'm staying at the Mayapur Institute, and we have land there, and we were trying to, to, to grow different things, you know? We grew rice. The birds all got fat. The birds ate all the rice. So many birds. I've never seen so many birds. They all came, and they ate our rice. Very difficult. You grow vegetables, the pigs will come, wild pigs, and oh, it's not easy to grow things because we don't like to use chemicals. So easiest thing to grow, mustard. Mustard seeds. I Bengalis love mustard oil, right? Cooking mustard oil. Bengalis love it. So mustard's easy to grow. You get a lot of mustard seeds. So you have a big bag of mustard seed. If you lose one mustard seed, is it a big deal? No, one mustard. So in the same way, one universe among so many universes, this whole cosmic manifestation, the material creation, just like a bag of mustard seeds. So if one 
uh, because Vasudev Datta was praying, deliver all the living entities, let them go back to Godhead. Mahaprabhu said, all right, by your desire it will be done. And they were all liberated. Just like you take out one mustard seed from the bag of mustard seed, not a big loss, nobody worries about one mustard seed. It's not the same way. Every, everyone in the planet was liberated by the mercy of Vasudev Dutta. Another example was given in Chaitanya Charitamrita. The farmer has a herd of Kamadinu cows. He has a herd, a big herd of Kamadinu cows. And he loses one billy goat. Are you going to worry about one billy goat when you have a herd of Kamadinu cows? Not a big deal, not a big loss. You lose just one goat. You've got a herd of Kamadenu cows. So like this, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was describing how he can liberate the whole planet, all the sinful living entities. They can all be delivered. Of course, the planet fills up again. After they're all liberated, there's so many more conditioned souls still here in the material world. So we need many Vasudev Dattas to take the sins of the people, to have that mood, to take on the sinful reaction, just like Vasudev Datta. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appreciated so much this compassion of Vasudev Datta. And then Maharaj wants to say something. <laughs> uh, yeah, Lord Chaitanya said Vasudev Dutta was like a wing. If